Deborah, can you uh, see the screen? You should see uh, what is done. I do, Andrew, yes. Uh, we're now on record. I'm just making that known to the participants, and I'm indicating, Andrew, that I do see uh, your screen. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm Deborah Schleicher. Uh, this is the 7 a.m. webinar. The title of the webinar this is sort of like getting on the aircraft, uh, checking that you're in the right place, is Docker 101 for the federal government and Andrew Weiss presenting. I have on the attendee list currently uh, Don Aitken, Galen Brazel, Lynn Lopressi, Kyle Sessions, Lucas Boyd, Mike Smith, and then uh, two individuals from Docker, Betty and Brian. Joining the call is Mike Smith, Mike Augustine, Munikimar Akabon, and we have a call in user six. Andrew, whenever you feel comfortable, if you want to wait a few moments, but uh, the next voice you will hear will be Andrew Weiss presenting. Thanks, Deborah. We'll give it another minute here for a couple more folks to join in. Excellent. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, a couple minutes past the hour here, 10 o'clock, uh, at least for those of us on the East Coast, uh, maybe some folks on the West Coast joining. Uh, so my name is Andrew Weiss. I currently head up our federal sales engineering group here in the D.C. area. 
uh, with Docker. Uh, we do have a couple other folks uh, representing the federal team as well on this webinar and be happy to take additional questions uh, and whatnot toward the end of the session. But the purpose of today's webinar is to, you know, dive into, you know, what Docker is, you know, for those of you that have heard about it or have seen it in passing, you know, through other vendors and whatnot. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a 101. We're going to, you know, give this a little bit of a federal flair as well, you know, how Docker applies to, you know, your federal government uh, agency missions uh, and some of the things that we're doing around the security space and compliance worlds that are relevant in this space. So what is Docker? Uh, what is this buzz around this, you know, container company or this container thing that's been making waves over the last few years? Well, Docker is essentially the leading software container platform. Uh, we've been involved in this space for a few years now leading uh, this front predominantly on the open source side of the house where we've developed uh, container technology or we've made container technology usable uh, by an open source project that many of you have heard of, Docker, uh, probably or arguably one of the most popular open source projects, uh, at least in the recent years on GitHub. Uh, and we've really been building out this ecosystem across industry, working with a number of different vendors and uh, basically collaborating amongst a large community of contributors and so forth uh, in the open source world. Well, Docker is also managed and stewarded by a company, Docker Inc., that which we represent. Uh, and we do business across not only federal government, but we do business in commercial entities from finance to healthcare uh, to automotive, you name it. Uh, we're working with a number of different customers across that space. And we want to make it such that the technology that we built and harnessed it in containers is more usable and applicable to your software development uh, acquisition processes uh, and your own uh, development processes in-house. So since Docker is associated with containers for the majority of individuals, let's kind of just dive in and talk a little bit about, you know, what, what exactly is a container? What, is, what does this mean to me? Uh, and this is just, just kind of high-level type uh, content. This is not specific to any federal entities at this point, but we'll just kind of talk about, you know, what a container is at a high level. Uh, and to be honest, this technology has actually been around for, for quite some time. Uh, this is predominantly built uh, from the Linux ecosystem. Uh, the technology has been exposed in the Linux kernel for a number of years now, but what we did Docker is we actually made this technology a little bit more usable. Historically, it's been very hard and difficult to tap into the container technology at its core. It required a lot of low-level command line driven knowledge, uh, Linux kernel knowledge, uh, and so forth. But what we did is through this open source project initially is we abstracted a lot of this knowledge base and we essentially built a lot of standardized tooling methodologies and APIs to make containers usable. And at their core, containers are essentially isolated execution environments for applications or services uh, or uh, database queries and so forth. And they use the primitives provided by the Linux kernel. And they also use primitives now provided by Windows and Windows Server 2016. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So as you can see from the diagram on the left, and I love the little whale graphic uh, that which we represent Docker, you can see that underneath all of those container boxes is a shared kernel provided by Linux and of course on Windows as well. And each one of those containers can contain uh, what most folks are using today in their application development strategies. In that a container can house the dependencies for things like Tomcat, which is a web server for Java-based development. Uh, they can house things like .NET code, which you would historically deploy on a bloated Windows box or, you know, an internet information service. Or they can be as small as a single statically compiled binary, which only does the tasks that it's been built to do and has no other bloated dependencies that would help to uh, shrink the container down. So that's just containers uh, at a high level. The really cool thing about this is that this technology is provided by a lot of the major Linux distributions. So if you're familiar with the Linux world, uh, distributions like Ubuntu, CentOS, and Red Hat, uh, and even other distributions like Debian and so forth, this technology has become commonplace. And as we'll talk a little bit about later, we provide binaries for all of them. And we'll also talk a little bit more about how this technology is also now native to Windows Server. So for folks working in the federal government, uh, a lot of individuals working in technology, working in systems administration, are usually very comfortable with traditional concepts of virtual machines, where 
you know, 15, 20 years ago, folks started to realize that, you know, when you were uh, deploying uh, information systems on bare medical or physically racked servers, you know, it wasn't cost effective to have hundreds if not thousands of servers for a small set of application stacks. You wanted to kind of virtualize that infrastructure and technologies like VMware, ESX, and Hyper-V became commonplace. Let's go ahead and move further along and compare what containers are today to VMs or virtual machines. So if you look at the right, uh, you'll see this is a very common infrastructure diagram that folks are most often familiar with today in the virtualization world. So typically, if you're running a virtualized environment, you're going to have your underlying infrastructure, which will typically be uh, hardware in your own data center. Uh, you'll then have some sort of hypervisor on top of that infrastructure. So technology like VMware, Microsoft Hyper-V, uh, excuse me, Zen Server, and so forth. And then on top of that hypervisor stack, you'll have individual virtual machines, each running their own guest operating system, each whose compute resources some admin has allocated to that VM. And more importantly in this architecture is that each one of those virtual machines is prescriptive and has all of the dependencies and libraries and applications that are necessary to, that, for that VM to run. Uh, and if you look at scaling out virtualized infrastructures, you'll often have times uh, encounter things like VM sprawl, where you'll have, you know, hundreds if not thousands of guest operating systems, each running their own uh, version of an operating system uh, at varying degrees, each having their own prescriptive stacks of applications, and it was historically cumbersome to manage those stacks and and tool and configuration management tools have helped that over recent years, but it is still very difficult to manage at scale and doesn't adhere to kind of modern day software development principles uh, today. Now, if you look at the left, this is where containers that I just talked about come in. So if we take a look at the underlying infrastructure, that does not change. However, we no longer necessarily require a hypervisor on top of that infrastructure. You simply have a host OS. So that could be a Linux distribution, that could be Windows Server 2016. And on top of that comes this thing called Docker. And this is where we come into play. And Docker is essentially just software. It's a daemon or a service that runs on some sort of host OS. And that daemon allows one to create containers. And those containers, as I mentioned before, house the uh, application stacks necessary for your software to run. But if you notice, that container is fewer layers. There's no guest operating system in that container. There's no, you know, bloated dependency chain that that container needs to run. And you can run, instead of, you know, a few hundred virtual machines that you would run on a single hypervisor, you can run thousands of containers on a single host OS. So we're reducing layers of dependencies, and you'll also see that we're reducing layers of cost in your infrastructure. Now, most folks, if you look at this previous slide here on the left, you know, you're probably thinking, oh, does this mean I have to get rid of all of my VMware infrastructure and I'm just going to go back to bare metal and we're, we're back to where we were, you know, 15 years ago? Well, that's not what many folks are doing. In most cases, uh, you'll just simply leverage your existing virtualization infrastructure uh, at the same time. So if you look at the diagram on the right, you'll see that your infrastructure remains the same. Uh, so if you're running on premises and you're using a VMware hypervisor, for example, you'll see that you can actually just simply run Docker on top of your existing guest OSs. Uh, this allows you to leverage your existing infrastructure, leveraging existing investments in virtualization, but it also helps to reduce the complexity in that you no longer have to manage loaded guest OSs with all of those dependencies and having to patch and manage them. You simply have to manage a smaller guest OS with just the daemon running Docker, and you'll have, what you'll see later on in the presentation, are tools that you can manage containers at scale, and you can have simply much smaller application stacks uh, in, in your in ecosystem. These can also run side by side, so you can, of course, have traditional uh, uh, virtual machines running your traditional application stacks. You can also run your Docker daemon on other virtual machines with their container stacks as well. So you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, it is not opinionated in any means. You have a control over your infrastructure. And of course, this doesn't have to be infrastructure that you provide and maintain on premises. This could be hosted in the cloud on public providers like Azure or AWS. You can also leverage your own internal infrastructure as a service providers as well. So tools like OpenStack give you that flexibility. And just to kind of go on this topic a little bit more, here's another way to look at uh, containers and virtual machines. 
So if you think about a virtual machine today, you can compare it to a home, where your home has been built on a lot, which is connected to specific power lines and electric lines um, and plumbing utilities and so forth. And if you wanted to build a second home per se, you'd have to repeat this entire process up to code, you'd have to connect it to a different set of lines and you'd have to adhere to you know, other regulations and you'd have to essentially own the front door and own that utility connection point and so forth. They're essentially single units and self-contained and can be bloated and more difficult to manage. But if we compare that to virtual machines or rather containers, containers are more like apartment buildings where you have a central set of plumbing and utilities and those apartments share those plumbing and utilities, but the person living in an apartment doesn't own the front door. They only own the unit that they reside in, and they only own what's in that apartment. Uh, they're, of course, bound by certain restrictions in the apartment complex, so you can kind of think of that as like the shared kernel underneath. Uh, and of course, these things can rise and run side by side. Uh, an apartment exists or coexists next to other housing. That's another cool little nifty way to think about containers uh, and virtual machines. So why is, why is this all important? Now that we understand the gist of Docker, let's kind of step back a little bit at a little bit of a higher level. Well, the technology landscape is changing. Uh, when we talk about federal government initiatives, many agencies today, especially in the civilian government space, are looking towards some sort of public cloud strategy. Uh, we look at some numbers here. This is a survey that we conducted across uh, a lot of customers. This is outside of just the federal government uh, the beginning of last year. Uh, and if you look at most of where folks are going, they are looking at some sort of cloud strategy. A lot of folks are looking at some sort of private cloud strategy, but even more so, folks are looking towards public cloud providers that can help offset some of those costs and that can manage application stacks on the entity's behalf and at scale. And Docker, as we'll see, can really help drive that cloud uh, adoption strategy. Uh, there's also uh, various app modernization initiatives so VMs have been become very prescriptive to various uh, application development methodologies. So things like two-tier, three-tier stacks have become very commonplace. And we're helping to kind of change that a little bit to help shrink some of those application stacks, make them scale, make them cloud native, uh, and using things like our methodologies, if you may have heard of microservices uh, and so forth. And then of course, all of this together really helps an agency adopt DevOps. You know, DevOps, of course, it's about you know, tooling and processes that are inherently required, but DevOps is even more so about a, a, processy, a process and culture change that's inherent to an organization. And when an organization starts to adopt container strategies and leverage software like our Docker stack, they actually start to inherently uh, achieve certain DevOps goals that they may not have been looking to achieve uh, initially, but kind of inherently do so throughout their deployment lifecycle. But let's also step back as well, and what are some of the things holding back all of this uh, innovation? You know, we, we all want to get to, a, you know, a DevOps state. We all want to get to uh, some sort of cloud state, whether that's hybrid infrastructure or cloud native and so forth. And of course, we all have want to have, you know, modern application stacks, you know, mobile first uh, in many cases. And we want to make sure that they can scale out, scale in, and support all of these different infrastructures. Well, if we look at the challenges today, infrastructure is just kind of a smorgasbord of everything. You have old hardware and, and maybe new technology that you're that you're experimenting. You know, you have some bare metal, some virtual machines. You know, I mentioned hybrid infrastructure, and and you're also looking from the government side. How do we connect all this together? And we have all these government regulations, like you know, how do we connect to the cloud through the tick and so forth? And and of course, we also have you know heterogeneous uh, operating system infrastructure. So things like a mix of Windows and Linux. And even in the Linux world, you have a wider range of distributions. Um, and then if you look at some of the uh, cultural silos that maybe exist in an organization around the DevOps space, you know, you're going to have a, a plethora of different teams. You're going to be, you know, facilitated by certain changes uh, in the administration and so forth, and even further so in your agency. And there's going to be different inefficiencies that kind of uh, have been pulled down from uh, from previous changes in the organization. And it really helps to, I shouldn't say helps, but it really slows down the, the release cycle. Docker can help solve a lot of these challenges. And these are some of the places that we're already doing so. Uh, these are enterprise customers of Docker today. These are all public case studies. Uh, you'll notice in the middle, uh, obviously we're focused on the federal government space. GSA is a great case study of ours. 
Uh, you can go to our website and learn a little bit more about this. Uh, but this is their uh, BSP platform that they're running uh, internally for government procurement. This is a very large, well-known platform, actually, uh, across government. This is all actually running uh, on containers today and being migrated even more so to more modern application stacks. And what GSA did is what they, they did is they took traditional application architectures running on virtual machines and they started by just containerizing them. So using the Docker tooling and the methodologies to get them there. But they didn't just modernize them at the same time. They just wanted to get them in containers so they can get some of the advantages around portability and so forth, which I'll talk about as well. And then after they've over time moved those applications to actually do the containers, they've started to, uh, in a piecemeal process, modernize each component of the application such that by the time they're you know, almost finished with this project, they've not only containerized their application stacks, but they've reduced their layers of cost, they've modernized a lot of their dependencies, and they've increased the amount of security that uh, the uh, organization is leveraging as part of this infrastructure. Other public sector use cases, Cornell University, of course, reduced maintenance costs. ADP is a fantastic premier uh, customer of ours as well. Uh, and there's a lot of great videos uh, out there from previous year's DockerCon uh, on some of those customers. So how else does Docker help with some of the things that I mentioned around, you know, reduced layers of cost, portability, and so forth? Uh, these are some great little statistics right here, again, from a, a survey last year. Uh, if you look at some of the improvements around being more agile in your software development uh, approaches, you know, reducing developer friction, or rather developer and operations friction, uh, you know, one of the really cool things that we help to eliminate is this quote-unquote work on my machine issues. Uh, essentially, wherever Docker runs, is where you can run your containers and where your application runs. So you build it once for your containers and you run it wherever the engine runs. And again, that engine can run anywhere on your on-premises infrastructure, on a number of operating system uh, versions, uh, rather different types, and of course, across public cloud providers. Uh, and portability is one of the uh, main uh, asks and concerns of the federal government, of course, uh, because you may be running in one infrastructure today, but a few years down the road, you know, you'll get a bill for that infrastructure that's just too much to swallow and you'll want to move that infrastructure around and, you know, be in this cloud first world that gives you a lot of choice. A lot of folks are looking towards that. And then, of course, you have control. So I mentioned reducing the layers of cost, reducing the complexity in managing traditional application stacks. You know, you no longer need uh, bloated configuration management tools per se to facilitate those stacks. Of course, they can all be used side by side, but we have to kind of reduce that and give you more control uh, over this platform. And ultimately, this culminates uh, into you know, a single software supply chain. Uh, and we kind of coined this build, ship, and run, where you'll start on the left-hand side of this diagram with being able to build applications. And I mentioned this with GSA a couple slides ago. Where with Docker, we provide you a single set of tooling. Uh, this tooling is, uh, can be freely downloaded on your local workstation on Mac and Windows, and of course, on a Linux workstation as well. And you simply build your application using this packaging format. Packaging is a simple text file, simple command line tools, and also graphical tools, which I'll talk about as well. And you'll take an existing application stack or maybe a net new application project, and you'll build that for Docker. And you'll run it locally on your workstation where you have Docker installed. And that's really all that's necessary to build that application. Once you've built that application on your local workstation, and many times you can use existing frameworks and stacks that you're already comfortable with, regardless of the programming language, you can then ship that application off and run that on any infrastructure that is running Docker, like I mentioned previously. And the shipping phase to this is essentially a repository of content that you, your federal agency, would maintain and manage behind your firewall, either on-premises in your existing infrastructure, in the cloud, on Azure AWS, and so forth, or both. Uh, this content can be uh, what we call signed and verified, and you can then run that content anywhere a Docker engine runs through standard interfaces, standard tooling, and so forth. And at the end of the day, this culminates into greater agility, greater portability, uh, complete infrastructure uh, and cloud agnosticism, uh, resilient, and of course, cost efficient uh, application stacks. And this is a little bit of a more detailed diagram of what that looks like. So like I said before, developers would build their applications on workstations that have Docker installed. These can be in-house developers, or they can be contractors that are brought in simply with Docker installed on their workstation uh, or workstations that one manages. They build those applications for Docker and they push them to uh, a shipping endpoint or what we call a registry. 
And we have varying types of registries. A registry can be a private registry that the agency would manage uh, themselves. Or we also have what's called a Docker store, which has a mix of both public and private content. And the Docker store has uh, a, a, a plethora of source content from providers uh, like Splunk and Microsoft for .NET applications and Java and so forth. And this is content that one pulls down and builds against all the dependencies that are necessary and can be essentially re-signed and brought into the organization's own private registry. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, store in a few slides. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, you see the runtime stack where you're doing things like cost optimization. You're no longer having to manage, you know, expensive and complex stacks. You simply manage the Docker engine itself. And we provide you tooling to get a nice view of the containers that are supporting your application. And the really cool thing about this is you don't have to abandon your traditional application development methodologies. You can continue to build monolithic type applications using traditional two, three tier stacks. You can have ISVs or leverage ISV solutions from the Docker store, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And of course, you can also start to leverage more modern development methodologies like microservices, being able to split your application up into smaller uh, pieces that each one of those pieces does something very, very well, and it's all API first uh, and so forth. So how do we provide enterprise support? You know, where does Docker, the company, come in uh, for this? Because a lot of this has been uh, culminating through the uh, open source Docker project, and what we've done is we've essentially taken that open source project, and we've provided Docker itself, the software, in a couple of different forms for enterprises to take advantage of. The primary form is what we call Docker Enterprise Edition. Uh, this is a certified uh, daemon. This is a certified application stack with enterprise support from Docker, varying tiers. We provide you with certified infrastructure from uh, both ourselves and various vendors. And we also provide certified containers and base images that you can inherit from. So things like, I want the official Java JDK image. That's the one I'll build from using my Docker certified store. Or let's say I want the you know, certified uh, .NET image, that's the one I'll get. And the really cool thing about this certified infrastructure containers and plugins is that we will support them ourselves and also alongside the vendor on which you're running. So Enterprise Edition is available on specific distributions of Linux, and we also provide it on Windows Server and both uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure. Uh, and, of course, Oracle Linux as well and Red Hat. Uh, and then going more detail into the certification program, so I talked a little bit about Docker Store. And you can go to the website now if you're interested, store.docker.com. And it's the central hub for all uh, official Docker-based content. So I mentioned this before. So if you have Java application stacks or specific frameworks uh, or languages that you want to build from, those can be found in Store. And Store is made up of two different sections. Uh, the main section here is the certified section. And this is certified content that we vetted that we've scanned and eliminated and ensured no vulnerabilities or any or in any of this content. We'll talk a little bit about that later as well. And we also not only certify the content, we also certify infrastructure plugins that you can take advantage of. So Docker, of course, can be used amongst a variety of different infrastructures, and many of those infrastructures you probably already have today in your own data centers. So things like NetApp storage arrays uh, or uh, Cisco networking stacks and so forth. Well, you can actually use certified plugins uh, that are certified by both us and the vendor to actually use that technology in concert with your container technology as well. So things like exposing storage arrays and storage volumes to the containers for stateful data and so forth. Uh, and then of course, you know, we certify our stack on specific infrastructure on various Linux distributions, on Windows Server 2016, uh, and of course, AWS uh, and Azure. So essentially here, what you have is a single platform for all of your applications, a single journey that you have to take. You can continue leveraging off-the-shelf software. You can build your own software. You can start modernizing your application stacks. You can do so in a trusted and resilient manner, which we'll talk a little bit about later on in the security section. Uh, and you don't have to go to all these different places to put these things together. You can go from one place uh, to do so. <laughs> So if you're curious as well, you know, how does this kind of fit in? What are the different tiers and what are the different feature sets that are available with Enterprise Edition? So, of course, if you're looking to just kind of uh, get started with just an engine-only deployment, uh, you can simply use what we call Enterprise Edition Basic, which is just the engine and the certified infrastructure containers that are used to support that. 
And then, of course, going up from there, we have uh, a more advanced application stack for enterprise application deployments. So as you start to scale out your infrastructure, you'll have hundreds, if not thousands, of containerized application services. You want an easy, nice window into those services. So, of course, we provide what's called Docker Enterprise Edition Standard, which if you're familiar with Docker, was formerly known as Docker Data Center. And this is a single view into your applications with, of course, the enterprise capabilities that an agency is looking for. So, of course, if you have existing investments into things like Active Directory or you're looking towards O365 and Azure Active Directory, we can, of course, tie into uh, those uh, the directory services via LDAP. We provide things like role-based access, uh, access control, uh, content trust, and so forth. And then, of course, Advanced provides you with a security scanning of all that content. So this means that as you build your software, you can proactively scan all those dependencies and the compiled binaries that make up your software against known vulnerability databases. So where is Docker EE available? So Docker Enterprise Edition is available for a number of mechanisms. Uh, of course, uh, coming to the Docker sales team directly uh, through store, uh, through other vendors, and then through the cloud marketplace. But from a federal procurement standpoint, we are in GSA Schedule 70 and Soup V as well. So I mentioned a couple slides ago, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what is, what about security? You know, security is a first and foremost concern for a lot of different entities worldwide, especially in an era rife with cyber threats and so forth. Uh, and given the tremendous focus on cybersecurity, uh, one of the really cool things that has been asserted in the container ecosystem has actually come from, of course, well-known place, Gartner. Gartner actually has asserted that deploying an application in a container is inherently more secure than deploying on just bare OS or even on a virtual machine. Uh, we take advantage of the Linux isolation capabilities and resource allocation capabilities. Through partnerships like Microsoft, we can even do greater isolation by providing things like dedicated kernels to container. We take security very seriously at Docker. We work with various security groups, uh, like the National Computing Center. We work with a CIS to develop benchmarks. Uh, we also have guidance around FedRAMP and NIST, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, needless to say, security is a really important topic for us and something that we really build into all of our infrastructure, even at the core engine level. And what are the key components that actually make up security? Well, security should not have to be complicated. Uh, and especially in an age where security technology is becoming very difficult to use and manage, you know, we want to make security technology usable. You should have a single view into your application stacks. You should be able to see all the things that make up that application. And in one view, you should also be able to see any vulnerabilities associated with that application stack all before it even ends up in your runtime environment. We can do that through things like Docker security scanning through Docker EE advanced. You also want to ensure that the content is delivered in a trusted manner and hasn't been tampered with. And this is something that uh, has been tried in the past, essentially ensuring the integrity of your software as it navigates through the software development lifecycle. Uh, how do we prevent someone from tampering with that content between build systems? Or how do we prevent someone from tampering that content as it makes its way into your production environment? Well, we can do that through things like Docker Content Trust and ensuring that your content is cryptographically signed and validated and ensuring that that content has been signed by all the appropriate individuals or teams or systems before it even runs in some sort of runtime environment. And of course, all of this through an infrastructure independent methodology. We, of course, secure the daemon, the runtime daemon. Uh, we secure it and certify it on those specific platforms so we can really build security uh, at our core. And all of this put together are, gives you safer applications. So moving on slightly uh, for some more federal specific uh, compliance controls, one of the things that we did is uh, due to customer demand and due to agency demand is, you know, what about things like FedRAMP and NIST? You know, I'm a government entity. When I deploy an information system, I have to get an ATO. And I have to authorize a system. And our containers are more complicated. Does this complicate things? How do I do this? Things like that. So what we did is we actually took that feedback and we built what are called uh, control guidance for uh, both the NIST 853 and, of course, FedRAMP moderate baseline. And the really cool thing about this content is this guidance to help expedite your own ATO process. So if you start to look towards Docker to containerize your application stack, and you start to look towards our enterprise application platform, you want to start thinking about the ATO process 
kind of before you even get started, you know, what's it going to take? You know, what does this authorization pipeline look like? Well, we've actually open sourced the entirety of this content. And what's even cooler is that we've actually waived all the licensing rights to the control guidance because we want to basically contribute back to the container ecosystem. And we want to contribute back to the government ecosystem as well. So what this is entirely open source is this is NIST 853 and FedRAM guidance for actually ATOing your platform. And the really cool thing is that we actually use an open source tool called Open Control, actually built and managed currently by GSA and a few other uh, industry vendors. And this is, you can think of as kind of this uh, compliance as cold code toolkit. Here at Docker, we treat uh, everything really in the same way. We're a tooling company. We want to be able to deliver things in an agile manner. And that should be no different than documentation. So Open Control allows us to actually auto-generate security documentation, which you can also take advantage of. And that security documentation can be updated as our product updates, all using configuration files. Of course, we also offer this guidance through uh, SSP templates. Again, purely guidance. We are a software vendor. We are not a cloud service provider. So we, of course, inherit controls from existing cloud service providers. Uh, so we have provided a rebuilt blueprint for running Docker Advanced, or rather Docker Enterprise Edition Advanced on Azure. And we also have one coming for AWS GovCloud uh, as well. Needless to say, this is all essentially the same content, all open source and all using uh, the Open Control Toolkit uh, uh, for this initiative. Uh, and of course, we help expedite the uh, ATL process and we're happy to facilitate that uh, going forward. So what are the next steps? How do I get started with Docker? You know, there's been a lot of content here uh, and there's a lot of great, uh, other great content that's out there. Well, of course, go to our website, docker.com. We have a number of different webinars. We have a couple webinars coming up uh, that talk about some of our new announcements around Enterprise Edition and so forth. Uh, we have our government case studies as well, our public sector case, case studies. And then of course, next month, we have our annual DockerCon event in April in Austin, Texas. And a few weeks after that, for federal folks, we have a summit right here in DC uh, at the museum. Sorry, the uh, typing error right there. That's the museum. Uh, great location. Uh, we have hands-on labs, a lot of uh, great content geared towards uh, government entities and federal agencies and so forth. And there'll be a lot of great individuals on hand to answer any questions uh, you have. And of course, great partners there to support that event. So what I'm gonna do right now is I am going to, uh, since we have some time here, uh, you've seen a little, or you've heard a little bit about Docker, what is it? Or, and let's actually see what it looks like. So Docker at its core is essentially a command line tool. And if you can see my screen right now, you can actually see this little whale right here in my taskbar. And I happen to be running uh, a Mac OS 10 workstation, but you could be running Windows 10, you can have a Linux workstation, uh, or a Windows Server 2016 box, uh, tons of flexibility here. And this tool set here is what we call uh, Docker Community Edition. This is the free to download tool set that you can run on your workstation. Uh, this allows any developer, any workstation to kind of get started with Docker. And at its core, Docker really is just a set of command line tools. And I'll expand that a little bit. And if I just type in Docker right here, I have Docker installed. And at its core, like I said, a set of command line tools. We include a number of different tools uh, to uh, support that whole ecosystem. We also work with a number of industry vendors to make, uh, working with Docker easier in existing development environments. So if I go here, you can see that I'm actually running uh, an editor here. This is uh, what's called Visual Studio Code. Uh, this is an open source uh, cross-platform editor uh, built and managed by Microsoft. And there's actually out of the box Docker support right from this editor. This right here is a simple .NET Core application. And if you're not familiar with .NET or .NET Core, don't fret. If I just hit the start button here, what this is gonna do is it's actually gonna run my application build it in a container and run it and debug it live in a container locally on my own workstation. So I've, Microsoft has made it easy and through our partnerships with different vendors and software developers, we've made it easy to really get started with Docker without having to dig into the specific tooling stacks. And actually here on my other monitor, it went ahead and it started my application. This is running live with debugging if I so choose to set a breakpoint in a container on my local workstation. But this is great. We can run a container on a local workstation, but what does this really do for our whole software development lifecycle? What about pushing this application into some sort of environment? Well, what I've done behind the scenes is I've actually taken the source code and committed it to a version control system. That version control system is running out on the public cloud. 
Uh, it happens to be actually on Azure Government, which I'll show you right here. Azure Government, again, this is one example of a public cloud provider. Uh, this also works directly with Docker as well through the Azure Government Marketplace. And I have a simple set of infrastructure that's been deployed uh, supporting my environment, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, this infrastructure in a second. Uh, but this is actually where I've essentially pushed my code. I've pushed it to a version control system. And behind the scenes, that version control system has gone through and actually has built my application for me. And remember, in that diagram, we had the build stage, which is developer has their code, they push it to some sort of system, which is a tool like Jenkins or so forth, and actually builds my application. And in the middle, you saw the ship phase, your own registry for your content. And we call that Docker Trusted Registry. So I'll go ahead and move that here. So this is what Docker Trusted Registry looks like. This is the set of content that you would manage behind your firewall. This could be either on a public cloud provider within your own virtual network space. This could be on premises. You can have multiple registry endpoints for high availability or for caching purposes and so forth. And this stores all of my content. And as you see here, this application, this image is what uh, was deployed to my stack. And I'm calling this the ASP.NET Core, ASP Core MVC image. So if I click on the Images tab in the registry, you can see the various versions of my image. So I have the latest version right here, and I also have a, a tagged version that's mapped to my uh, version control system's uh, Git hash. You can also see here that there are uh, vulnerabilities associated with this image. So I clearly didn't do a good job making sure that I was using the latest bits with no vulnerabilities. The cool thing here is that if I click on Details, I can actually see all the vulnerabilities that make up this image. So things like, all right, this version of Bash in the image is, has a vulnerability, or this package, uh, when I've installed updates, no vulnerabilities here, any of my source code, I'm going to pick it up. And you can also see a component map of those vulnerabilities. The cool thing is this is a proactive process. This syncs up to uh, CVE databases uh, on the web through things like the MITRE database and the NVD database. And you can also get this database from us and publish into your own offline environment if you don't want any, of course, internet connected systems. So this is great. I've got my content here. Uh, it's been what we call signed. So the content uh, has been uh, cryptographically stored in my repository. But how do I get this into my runtime environment? Uh, so you saw the build, ship, and run. So what our behind the scenes system is doing is it's not only built the system, but it's now going to push it into my runtime environment. And that runtime environment is what we call universal control plane. Universal control plane right here. It's essentially that single plane of glass view into all of my containers. So all of the infrastructure supporting my containers, you can see here this is a three node cluster, all running Docker, all running the same OS. Uh, this could have, these all happen to be running a distribution of Linux, uh, but this could have been, this could have been Red Hat, this could have been sent OS. Uh, and soon enough, next month, this will also be able to be Windows Server 2016 nodes as well, in which you can leverage uh, uh, that technology. Today. So I've gone ahead and deployed my application here. The application, as you can see, is right here, this ASP.NET Core application. And if we go ahead and take a look here, this is now running uh, locally. And if you have, if you're in front of your computer screen, feel free to go to this website and you can see this application running. The really cool thing here is if you look in the footer, you can see that I'm actually showing the container ID that this application is being presented from. So if I hit refresh a bunch of times, my you can see that now it's actually connecting to the second container. So this container, this application is actually made up of two containers, all being load balanced automatically behind the scenes through both the Azure load balancer and Docker's internal load balancing mechanisms. And all I had to do was a simple Docker command to actually deploy this, and I have full resiliency of this application across hosts and across multiple containers. So, you saw a full end-to-end -end deployment of a uh, Docker image from the moment I built and ran it on my local workstation here in Visual Studio Code as a developer to when it got sent to Docker Trusted Registry and stored and scanned for any vulnerabilities to when it was actually in the runtime environment. And I didn't change a single line of code here. This is the same exact code running. Uh, you can see this is the same exact Docker file that's uh, been mapped to the application, and it runs in the exact same manner uh, in that environment. 
and of course, I could have tweaked this uh, as well. So in the production environment, maybe I want to connect up to a different database, or if I want to use a different uh, API key, I can, of course, do that with Universal Control Plane. I can tweak the parameters in those different environments. But at its core, it all leverages Docker, and it all leverages the same engine, uh, such that I don't have to manipulate the application uh, at very right time. And as I mentioned, this whole stack is also, I can go through the whole uh, ATO process. So I can run that uh, compliance tooling, auto-generate my documentation, and ensure that my infrastructure is running up to speed uh, in a compliant manner at that baseline. So that, I'm going to leave about 15 minutes for questions. There was a lot of content. Uh, happy to go through any specific slides or items, or if any folks want to see uh, specific pieces of the demo, a little bit more detail, happy to answer those questions, either via chat. And we also have a couple other folks from Docker on as well to answer any questions uh, as well. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to uh, give you two questions from Mike Smith. The first is, do people typically install one container to one VM? or do they deploy a larger VM to host multiple containers? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, we see a nice mix. So a lot of folks that want to do containers at scale will have uh, slightly larger VMs, and they can do uh, hundreds if not thousands of containers uh, for those virtual machines. Uh, the point is they're very ephemeral, so you don't have to really think in terms of containers. You think in terms of the applications that are really driving that container development. But we also see use cases more so in the science and research communities where uh, developers or researchers are looking purely for portability. So they have bloated application stacks, and historically it was difficult to install those application dependencies, run all that infrastructure, and support it. And that's where we see folks doing more of a one-to-one -one container to VM mapping. Uh, and we actually, there's a use case out there already uh, within the National Institutes of Health, where one of the researchers working on MRI research actually runs a single container per a single VM, and the reason that researcher does that is purely for portability. Uh, this person doesn't want to have to reinstall all those dependencies, wants to take full advantage of the compute power provided by the VM, and can deploy that at scale across multiple VMs and not have to install all that infrastructure. They simply have to manage a single Docker file and deploy it to wherever Docker runs. So a nice mix of different use cases. Andrew, Mike, the, uh, Mike Smith then asks, how are containers backed up? Yeah, so a lot of concepts have really changed with traditional, uh, uh, rather changed from traditional application infrastructures. So in a VM world, you have to think of, all right, how do I back up my guest OS, and do I include the application state, and what about any file dependencies? Well, containers, and if you look on the screen here, what defines a container is a simple text file. And if I want to change what's in my container, I simply change a line in my text file, and I rebuild it and push it to my registry. So backing up is essentially just Instead of backing up, you're building an image and pulling down a different version of that image, which you saw here in the registry. So if I go back here to my uh, environment, I have different versions of my image. So if I want to back up, per se, I'm essentially building a version of my image, and if I want to run a previous version of that image, I would just pull down this image and just run it. There's no software installation. There's no having to worry about then backing up that software and saving it somewhere. All the dependencies your application need are defined within this image, and you pull it down uh, and simply run it. Now, of course, if you have additional data sources that you're connecting to that need to be less ephemeral and more stateful, of course, you can continue storing that data in your traditional environments. So things like connecting back up to a SQL database or an Oracle database, or using uh, database providers like uh, Azure SQL and so forth. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility with that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, if any of the other participants have a question, uh, please log them now, and I will read them uh, to Andrew for a response. Andrew, how do you phrase the argument that a Linux kernel is the same everywhere? So like if the developer uses Alpine and Prod uses R-H-E-L, why is, why is this not a problem? Yeah, so that goes back to uh, the Docker certified program. So we try to, uh, obviously there are hundreds of Linux distributions that are out there. So of course we have to have a, some sort of limitations around the distributions that we support. So in the client side tooling, we have, like I said, Docker Community Edition. And that supports a slightly larger array of Linux distributions. Uh, we can of course provide additional support uh, on top of that. For production purposes, we want to control that a little bit more. So while you still have flexibility in the Linux distributions that you run, 
We're not going to support maybe some of the more obscure, lesser known or lesser used uh, Linux distros. So for Enterprise Edition in a production environment, you know, we're going to support a specific distribution followed by a specific version of a kernel or at least a certain version of a kernel. And the same goes in the Windows world. Uh, we're not backwards compatible with Windows Server 2012. This technology is all net new in Windows Server 2016 and will continue to support uh, uh, the additional uh, distributions of uh, Windows going forward uh, as well. Andrew, can you install regular window applications into Docker containers in window 2016? You sure can, yes. Uh, and uh, we, we didn't talk about this too much in the presentation, but we've actually developed a partnership uh, working hand in hand with Microsoft for the past, I'd say, almost three years now. In Microsoft, what they did is they actually created container technology directly into Windows. And this is available in both Windows Server 2016 and also uh, Windows 10. And what you can do is you can take advantage of that technology using the same exact Docker tooling that you saw here in the Linux world, in that you download Docker for Windows, which is Docker for Windows Community Edition, just free to download on your local workstation. And you can actually start building your applications the way you would traditionally build them with .NET, but in containers. So you would inherit from some version of .NET, or, and then you would install your you know, web config file and copy your uh, MS Field dependencies and, and so forth. So yes, we do support Windows applications. We've worked with customers as far back as .NET 2, .NET 2.5, and we actually already are working with federal agencies today in partnership with Microsoft to take legacy Windows application stacks and even more modern Windows application stacks and containerizing them. And the really cool thing is that next month, uh, you'll be able to see both Windows and Linux nodes running in the same cluster, all managed by uh, Docker Data Center, or rather Docker Enterprise Edition, uh, like you saw here in this window. Andrew, uh, Mike Augustine asks, uh, Docker Data Center is not called that even when hosted locally now, or is that just the cloud offering? Yeah, so Docker Data, uh, we basically renamed it. So. Uh, what you know of is Docker Data Center, which is our enterprise stack of uh, both uh, the engine itself, uh, Docker Trusted Registry, and Universal Control Plane. We've essentially rebranded that as Docker Enterprise Edition Standard. And then the next version up, Docker Enterprise Edition Advanced, includes our security scanning piece that you saw in the registry uh, here for vulnerabilities. So we're still keeping the Docker Data Center naming, just so folks aren't too confused. But we are moving towards the Enterprise Edition uh, standard and advanced uh, nomenclature as well. Does the AWS quick start of DDC work in GovCloud? Very good question, yeah. So the way we've published things into commercial, I, and I assume the question is AWS GovCloud. The way we've published it, uh, since there is no marketplace in AWS GovCloud, uh, we do provide two options. Uh, if you're deploying just the engine only, uh, you can deploy the engine, and that's just a, a pay-as-you-go AMI from the commercial editor. But we also have a, a, a CloudFormation template as well, which we are updating and tweaking to run in GovCloud, and we are in talks with Amazon to make that a little bit more seamless as well in AWS GovCloud. Uh, in Azure government, uh, since there is a marketplace, we are actually already published there, and you can start using that today. Uh, right now, you'll see the engine only. We are actually, I should say, we're about to publish the new uh, Enterprise Edition standard in advance as well through the marketplace. Uh, but you can certainly get the template directly from us for both providers as well and deploy them into GovCloud and Azure Government. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, from Glenn Posey, uh, will license pricing remain the same, at least for the near term, for DDC to EE? Correct. The licensing hasn't changed. Uh, if you started to look at the licensing for security scanning, uh, that's the same additional add-on as what you see with Docker Enterprise uh, Edition Advanced as well. So the, the upfront licensing pricing has not changed. All right, let me just test for any additional questions at this time. Let's wait one moment just uh, for processing. Andrew, I see no additional questions. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. This has been recorded and will be made available, uh, I believe, after the presentation. Uh, we will also send out uh, our contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out. <clears throat> uh, you know, definitely looking forward to working with a lot of folks that may be interested in leveraging Docker for their own uh, development initiatives. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the recorded uh, session, and uh, we are now ending the session.